Well, welcome to Oak Hills Community Church. Wasn't that beautiful? Thank you, Heather. All right, now it's your turn to make music. So if you'd stand with us, we'll open in a word of prayer, and then we're going to sing all glory, laud, and honor. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace in bringing each of us here. We thank you for the joy of the season, the joy because of what we benefit from, from, from the sacrifice that you made through Jesus on the cross and his resurrection. Father, we thank you for bringing each of us here today that we may worship together so that we may lift our voices in a manner worthy of you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One, two, three, four. Would you all make sure you shake hands with the whole Emory clan over here? Um, but go ahead and greet one another as you're going. to Oak Hills Community Church. Thanks for coming this morning to worship with us and to study in God's Word together. Uh, just a few brief announcements here. Uh, this is Communion Sunday, and we put the little cups out. Hopefully you got one on the way in, and for those that haven't dealt with these little trick cups before, I want to warn you, you want to turn it upside down and get the wafer out first because there's always a drop of juice left, right? If you do the juice first, it's up to you to figure out how to get that wafer out of there, okay? So uh, you've been warned in advance. We have a special person that we want to recognize this morning. I think you've all probably met him, but a special event in his life has come up. Patrick, would you stand up over there? My understanding is you just retired. Yeah. Congratulations on that. And it's your birthday. All right. Uh, since I'm a lousy singer, would you guys? 
go with happy birthday for this gentleman? Sure. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday and retirement. Happy birthday to you. Figured I'd get that retirement thing in there, too. Yeah, and God bless you. All right, uh, that's it. Back to worship. Okay. Well, in that case, uh, we're going to go ahead and keep singing if I can find my pedal there. <clears throat> and uh, as usual, if you're able to stand, we'd love for you to stand. If not, feel free to sit, but you sing twice as loud, right? Right, Kathy? <laughs> I, know you, I know you wish you could. All right. Praise is rising. <clears throat> One, two, three, four.
survey. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the your love is amazing and divine. Father, we give you our lives to serve as you see fit. Father, help us to see where you're involved in, in ministering to people and calling them to yourself. Help us to see that so we might join you in your work. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you. Y'all can have a seat. Michelle's going to come and lead us in our prayer time, and Pastor Mark's going to bring us a message. Good morning. 
This is the time in our service when we share prayer requests and we have the opportunity to pray for one another with one another. So thank you for sharing your requests. Um, I'll also add that it's great to see so many people here today because we have barbecue after church. So, and if you've never tried macaroni and cheese that's been smoked in a smoker, I highly recommend it. We also have that too. So I hope everyone can stay uh, to join us in fellowship after the service. Uh, we do have a quick praise to share, an update on Ryan, Joyce's granddaughter. Uh, she did go through a series of tests, and the, the great news is that she had a vertebra in her neck that was broken. It was, it was actually misaligned, and she was not able to hold her head up, and that is fully recovered now. She is healed. So that part is a wonderful praise, yes. Yes, she continues to have some health struggles, and we continue to pray for her, but that's a wonderful praise. Please, please join me in prayer. Father God, you are the maker, the creator of heaven and earth. We praise you. We thank you. Father, even the stones would have cried out as Jesus came in on the triumphal, triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Father, we can't help but praise and cry out and say, what a wonderful God. What an amazing God. Hosanna in the highest. Father, you call our hearts to you, and we can't resist. Thank you for your wonderful grace. Thank you for the love that covers us, the love through the sacrifice on the cross that Jesus Christ made. Father, help us to remember this week that enormous cost something that we could never pay, something that we could never do, and yet is the greatest gift of all, that all we need to do is believe and accept that free gift in Christ to have eternal life. Father, we lift our prayers to you today. We bring you Grayson. This little boy continues with his leukemia treatments. He has a very difficult one coming up next Friday. We pray for his continued strength and his endurance through you, Father. I'm told that this little boy knows that prayers are being answered and many people are praying for him. And so, Father, we continue to ask for good results to his treatment and for full recovery and that his maintenance plan for the next one and a half years would go very well. Father, we lift up Caleb. This young man awoke after being in a coma last week and we pray for his continued full healing without any complications. Please strengthen him through his rehab and encourage his family as they are there by his side for each step. Father, we do thank you and praise you for the work you're doing in Ryan and her family. The test showed some good results and there are still things that need to be addressed. But Father, we know that she is in your hands and we ask that you would continue to improve her development and her treatment and give her and her mother safe travels back to the U.S. in May. Father, we lift up Thomas. We ask for full healing and recovery following neck surgery to remove cancer last week. We ask that all of the cancer would be removed, that he would have no additional complications from the surgery, and that you would encourage Thomas and his wife. Father, please continue to strengthen Benjamin Help him in his healing and rehabilitation, that he would get stronger each day. And Father, thank you that Duke's test results have been good so far, and we pray that he would have a plan for extended maintenance treatments on his cancer very soon, and that he would continue to be healed and fully recovered, Lord. Please walk with he and Mary and encourage them in this time. And Father, we lift up Zach and Kelly as they adjust to new work demands and a new schedule, help them to find peace in this very stressful and challenging healthcare situations in which they are helping others to recover by your grace, Father, by the work that you're doing through them. We thank you for that, and we ask that you would give them comfort in this time and time with their family and time to adjust to the new schedules. Father, we lift up the people of Ukraine we ask for an end to this war, that you would protect and deliver them, help them as they are seeking refuge, help them to understand that they need to seek refuge in you, Father. We ask that you would change hearts and minds, that you would 
guide the leaders with your wisdom, Father, and that there would be an end to this evil. And Father, we pray for our own country, that there would be an end to the abominations in our country that are against your word. These things that have been made legal by man, Father, many of them impact our children. Please, Father, change hearts and minds and bring our leaders to repentance. Help them to see that following you is the only way. And Father, we pray that for our family members, our friends, those who do not know Jesus. We pray that you would open their hearts, soften them, bring them to you, that they would accept salvation. And Father, we pray for EFCA churches and especially for Oak Hills Community Church. Continue to strengthen and equip us, Lord. Give us those opportunities to share your good news. Help us to welcome people in and to share the truth of your word. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Imagine a stranger visiting a church service for the very first time. He was not brought up in the Christian culture, so he knows nothing about Christianity. He is interested to learn, even though he doesn't know anything. He is open. He's engaged. When he comes into the service, he sees the cross. When he sits down, he sits down next to a man, and the man has a cross on his lapel. The woman sitting next to him has a cross on her necklace. Finally, he looks up at the stained glass window and there too sees a cross. When communion is served, talk is made about the body and blood of Christ. Finally, the service ends with another hymn. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. When the stranger leaves, he is impressed. But he wonders about that. Is it really true that Christians only glory in the cross? Is it really true that the death of someone so long ago is the total focus and that everything else we pour contempt on compared to the cross. He wonders if the talk is not exaggerated a little bit, but he's open to learn. Next week is Easter. We'll talk about the resurrection. It seemed to make sense to me to talk about the cross today. And so, this morning, we'll be going through the Gospel of Matthew, beginning in chapter 20, and walking through the events leading up to the cross. You're welcome to turn there. We're going to begin in Matthew 20, verses 17 and beyond. And here is where the cross is predicted. It reads like this. Now, Jesus was going up to Jerusalem on the way he took the twelve aside and said to them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. The book of Matthew is all about the kingdom of God. And Jesus has been teaching this to his disciples. But he tells them again, perhaps the third time, he will be killed. And even though they've heard it again and again, it's like they never heard it. It's not that they didn't hear the, the sound. They heard the words. But their dreams, their vision, their ambition was so set on the kingdom being set up right then 
Why? Because they wanted to be like his junior partners in the kingdom. And so they're thinking of their own benefit, what they want to see. And so when he tells them he's going to die, it just doesn't soak in. One aspiring mother of two uh, disciples brought her two sons with her and spoke to Jesus, perhaps at the son's prompting. And she asks something of Jesus. He says, what is it you want? And she says, when you are in your kingdom, I want my sons to be on your right and on your left. In other words, number one and number two in your kingdom. <laughs> well, what do you think the other disciples thought when they heard the other 10? They were angry. Why? Because they wanted those positions. <laughs> Well, some well-meaning Christians have thought that the kingdom was not an option. But clearly, Jesus did offer the kingdom. The Gospel of Matthew is all about this. And Luke 2 makes it clear that Jesus was the coming Messiah, whom they were to expect, the predicted one. But the problem was that on the whole, the Jewish people, and especially the leaders, were not open to receiving Messiah as their king. Christ came offering a kingdom, but he would not force his rule on a disobedient and unyielding people. Jesus made it clear he had a purpose from that point. He said he had come to give his life as a ransom for many. The next thing we see in Matthew is the triumphal entry. Jesus sends his men ahead in the city to get a, a donkey and the foal of the donkey. They place their coats on the backs of these two animals, and Jesus rides on one of them into Jerusalem. For those that were watching, those that were aware, Zechariah had predicted this as a sign, one of the many signs that would indicate who Messiah was. Zechariah 9, 9 reads this way. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He doesn't ride into Jerusalem on a great war horse. He rides into Jerusalem on a humble donkey, a more fitting sign of the peaceful Messiah that he is. Well, this is the official presentation of Jesus as the Messiah to Jerusalem, the son of David, whose right it is to reign. Did all the leaders of Israel rise up and say, Blessed are you, Jesus. Welcome to the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, of course not. If they had, their history would have been far different. Instead, they reject him. In fact, the next day it says they come as a group. Perhaps they had planned this that night. But they come as a group and they challenge his authority. One steps forward and a gifted teacher in the law, and they challenge him. They say, by what authority do you do these things? And Jesus knew their hearts. And he said, let me ask you a question. The baptism of John, was it of God or of men? And so they retreat for a little bit, and they pow out together and they say, now what, if, how do we answer this? If we say John the Baptist was of God, he'll say, well, why didn't you listen to him? Because he spoke of me. Well, I can't answer that. But if we say it was merely of men without divine authority, then the people are going to pick up rocks and start hurling them at us because they think John is a prophet. Now we can't answer that. So they come back to Jesus and they say, we don't know whose authority he did these things. And so Jesus, knowing that their heart was not open to truth, simply told them, therefore, I won't give you an answer either. 
Well, because of this rejection, Jesus announces judgment. So now we come to Matthew 23, and this chapter expresses the results of their choice for the past three and a half years. For three and a half years, he's been preaching, extending kindness and patience, bearing with them, answering their questions, even when they tried to trick him and trap him, he was patient with them. But our choices do have consequences, and theirs did. And so now he pronounces the resulting consequence. Seven woes that he pronounces for hypocrisy and pure evil. And he says, you killed the prophets. Your, your ancestors, they killed the prophets. And they, these people right before Jesus, they would kill the ultimate prophet, Jesus. What was the main thing that Jesus criticized the Pharisees and the leaders for? Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. High talk and low walk. More than anything, Jesus does not like hypocrisy. A person puts forth a false appearance of having virtue or religion, but it's not true. Or a person believes in particular things, but they don't follow what they believe. Their behavior does not match their beliefs. By the way, what should we be careful for? We need to be careful. Are Christians capable of doing this? Sure. And sometimes very easy as Christians fellowshipping together to get used to the idea that we're God's holy people, and we are, which means we should be holy, but we're not sometimes. One of the things I think we need to do is keep short accounts with God. We need to confess our sins as quickly as they come. It's easy to get into defense mode and want to stand in the way we're behaving, but God wants us to confess our sins. And he says in 1 John, he says, you know, if any man says he doesn't have any sin, he's not telling the truth. So we do sin, and God has a solution for that sin, a cleansing for us. First John 1 John 1.9, if any man confesses his sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins on a daily, moment-by-moment basis, restore us to family fellowship, and continue to cleanse us from all sin. So our daily confession is part of the process in which he is sanctifying us. We can't neglect it. We can't be hypocritical by thinking that we are beyond that. Oh, we have seen political mudslinging perfected to an art form, haven't we? <laughs> and certainly the Pharisees were engaging in that kind of activity. They said Jesus' miracles were done by the power of Satan. Wow. Well, when Jesus calls them out and pronounces these woes upon them, is he engaging in the same type of activity? Is his heart hypocritical? No. Even in judgment, he is caring and compassionate. Listen to the end of chapter 23. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. How often I have longed to gather your children together. As a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. After this, we see Jesus' final sermon. It's the longest recorded sermon we have in Matthew 24 and 25. We call it uh, the Sermon on Mount Olivet or the Olivet Sermon. It's Jesus' explanation, explanation of the future in light of Jerusalem's rejection 
of Messiah. Some have interpreted this to be fulfilled completely in 70 AD when Titus came and he attacked Jerusalem. And Luke does speak to this, I think. But in Matthew, we have judgment upon judgment in such a horrendous way that it could be described as if, if this didn't come to a close, if this time wasn't shortened, no one would be left alive. I don't think that that has happened yet. I think that this is talking about a yet future time. In fact, if you compare it with Revelation chapter 6, the six seals in which God, or Jesus Christ, breaks a seal and judgment is pronounced and that judgment happens on earth, those judgments line up perfectly with Matthew 24. They're talking about the same. And since this is a prediction of the future, and since Revelation is talking about this time and wasn't written until 95 AD or thereabouts, it couldn't have been fulfilled in 70 AD because in 95 AD, it's still in the future. So here we have Jesus' explanation of coming events. And this is a time like no other. The ultimate Armageddon, the catastrophe of catastrophes. And it hasn't happened yet. I believe Jesus' prophecies speak of the future where God pours out judgment on the earth, but the climax, the climax will be Christ's return. So we might ask this question, how is the biblical Armageddon different than, say, the movies that are all use the name Armageddon? What are the movies about? We've seen in many years. They're usually about what? Some catastrophe, some life-ending event on earth in which all of earth is destroyed and history comes to a close, or at least the potential is there. That's what they're all about. So here's a test for you. How is the biblical Armageddon different than the movies that we see? In the biblical Armageddon, it ends after judgment with Christ's return. It ends with the best thing that can possibly happen to this earth happening. The return of Christ in glory. The return of Christ making things right again. So friends, we have hope. It's a glorious thing. After he gives this sermon, he takes his disciples and they go to Gethsemane. They go to this place, which is an olive press in the midst of an olive garden. And he takes three of his closest disciples to walk a little further to an olive grove there. And Jesus prays. And the text says, Jesus became sorrowful. I think we can understand that as we reflect on what is coming. And he knew what was coming, and he knew how horrendous that would be. We can understand him becoming sorrowful. He told his friends, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. But they slept. Jesus prayed on, my father, if it is possible, May this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And friends, I think that is the secret of the Christian life. Not as I will, but as the Father wills. And if we could say that in earnestness, the battle is almost won in the Christian life. That was Christ. That was his heart, was to do the will of the Father, no matter what. As we proceed in Matthew, next we come to Maundy Thursday, or Holy Thursday. The night that Jesus celebrated the Last Supper with his 12 closest followers, 11 really, And he mandated communion. We're going to serve communion following this message. 
he gave them the opportunity and the command to eat the bread and to drink wine in order to remember his broken body and shed blood. It was also the night he was betrayed by Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve. Next, we come to Gethsemane. Uh, I'm sorry, I talked about that. Well, after Gethsemane, Jesus was arrested. While still speaking to his disciples at Gethsemane, Jesus, uh, Judas arrived leading a group of soldiers. And he kisses Jesus on the cheek to indicate to them which one to arrest. It's night and they don't know for sure who he is, so they have his plea pran plea formerly planned um, way of identifying him. And uh, Peter, to his credit, he wants to defend Jesus, so he takes out a sword, perhaps the knife that they'd used at Passover, and he attempts to whack one of the evil guys on the head, not being very good at his soldiering, he misses and all he gets is an ear. And Jesus says, put your sword away. If that were the plan, if that were the plan, he could call 12 legions of angelic warriors to his defense. But if he had done that, prophecy would not be fulfilled and our sins would still be there unpaid for. Next, we see Jesus before the Sanhedrin. When Jesus is arrested, he's taken to see Caiaphas, the high priest, and various leaders of Israel. The narrator tells us that they were looking for false evidence in order to convict him and put him to death, but they couldn't find any. So finally, out of frustration, Caiaphas demands of him, tell us the truth. I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you're the Christ, the Son of God. So Jesus answers, yes, it is as you say. But I say to all of you, in the future, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. At this, they tore their robes and said, He's guilty of blasphemy, and they all agreed to that. So what was the charge in the Jewish court? Blasphemy. He's blasphemed God. But they don't have the authority to put him to death. They have to go to the Romans for permission for that. So they change the charge. And what are they charging before the Romans? They say, he is guilty of rebellion. He's against Caesar. Pilate, you're his representative. You've got to convict him according to our preferences. You can see their ploys here. Now we come to Good Friday. And I am aware that there are people who have different views. Some believe Christ was crucified on Friday, some on Thursday, some on Wednesday. And I'm not going to explore that today. Good Friday is traditionally the day viewed as the day he died on the cross. Initially, Christians celebrated both the cross and the resurrection together as one event. We see in the book of Acts, it didn't divide the two. But in the fourth century, they started speaking of the cross separate, and they spoke of it as Good Friday. It is good because that is the day that God fulfilled his promise to take away our sins. And finally, we, we come to the crucifixion. According to tradition, Jesus died on Friday, and he was executed by crucifixion, the common form of death for criminals in the Roman Empire. Roman soldiers severely beat and whipped and mocked him. They nailed his hands and feet to a wooden cross. Two other criminals were crucified at the same time. 
death usually came after a prolonged period of time, sometimes lasting an excruciating two or three days. But Jesus was able to complete the punishment, complete the payment for all of our sins. And once that was done, he was able to dis dismiss his spirit. So when they came to broke, break the legs of the individuals to hasten their death, they didn't have to break his legs. The Bible says that Jesus' death is sufficient payment as the punishment for all mankind's evil. I want to read a longer passage from Matthew 27. Starting in verse 45. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. The words sounded like he was speaking of Elijah to them. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain in the temple, which some say was about four inches thick, was torn from top to bottom. That detail was given, giving us the indication that it was God who did the tearing. And then verse 54. When the centurion and those with him were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and all that happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. The Jewish people, his own race, rejected him. But the Gentiles, seeing all that happened, watching his character, they recognized the truth and who he was, the son of God. After crucifixion, he was buried. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, friends of Jesus, wrapped his body in a linen cloth and buried it that same afternoon in an above-ground grave, a cave that we call a tomb. At this point, I want to give a couple of applications. Jesus from the Pharisees' point of view, was defeated. They crucified him. He's dead. Problem solved, <laughs> in their point of view. But friends, that was truly the day that death died. A man who is born once, a woman who is born once, can experience physical death, the first death, and then spiritual death, the second death. Spiritual death is separation for all time from God, for those who reject the sacrifice of Christ. But those who receive it by faith in Christ get a pass on the second death. For them, spiritual death is a thing not to be feared. The sting of death has been taken away. Jesus' death is no accident, nor was it defeat. It was the plan of God. We may face trials. Some will even have tremendous trials, but that is not the end. Jesus is coming back. Jesus will make wrong things right. Jesus will make the dead live. And Jesus will banish evil and bring in righteousness. We have hope. Would you say that with me? 
We have hope. Amen. Never doubt the love of Christ for you. Life may bring challenges. People may reject you. Take heart. They rejected him too. Though you face rejection through relationships, divorce, jobs, and more, there is one who will never reject you. You have taken refuge in him. If Jesus died for you, if he lives to make intercession for you to the Father for you, He's not going to leave you. In every situation of every day, he is with you. The one who died for you is no Judas. He will not betray you. He is the faithful one. You can trust him with your eternity, and you can trust him with your life. Beautiful truth from the scriptures. as I shared, we are going to observe communion. In preparation for that, I want to begin by asking you a question. See if this feels true to you. It seems to me that for many of us who have been Christian for years, decades even, we've heard it so many times. We've heard about the death of Christ. We've been here at Easter every year. And I think sometimes we get so used to it, it loses some of it, the sharpness of what actually happened. This is an incredible event. This is what divides history. This is what determines our destiny. This is what gives us hope. And yet, I admit, sometimes it just seems like just one of many doctrines. I mean, we're all human. We have heard it a lot. So I began to wonder what might help it take a fresh impact on us. And so I thought of what if we put ourselves in that position? What if, say, we were right on the verge of death and someone stepped in and helped us? Wouldn't that be a tremendously impacting event for you? Dr. Stephen Bramer, professor and head of the Bible Exposition Department at Dallas Theological Seminary, and he was the person who was in charge over my dissertation project. He had kidney failure decades ago, and his sister stepped up and volunteered to give her brother her kidney, saved his life for decades. He's, he's been able to travel widely throughout the world and especially in Israel because of the things that she did for him. But now, that kidney too is failing. And he is in the final stages right now of kidney failure. He might die. But they've let people know about this event. And people have stepped up and offered their kidney. And so right now, this week, they're trying to identify the best match. And if this goes through, his life will be preserved at great cost to some individual who makes that sacrifice. Wouldn't you say that is significant? But how much more significant is the death of Christ who gave his life, not merely a kidney, but gave his life so that we could have eternity with God in heaven, so we could enjoy that with him. When I think about it in those terms, the death of Christ has much more impact. God sent his son. He sent his son, and the son volunteered to take the punishment that we deserve. It was the only way. He takes our sin and dies, and we get his righteousness. Friends, that is the greatest exchange in all of history. And he did it for us, for you, and for me. So now I invite us to do what he exhorted his disciples to do. 
when he had the Last Supper with them. The bread and the cup. I remember the order B before C. And so if you have a cup that has the two elements, I invite you to peel the top of the bread. Take the bread, take the cup, remember him. When you're done, if you'll pass the cup to the center aisle. As they finished taking those up, would you stand with us? We're going to sing our final song for the morning, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. Should I gain from his reward? I 
feel free to remain standing. Many of you know that uh, the founders of our church are Dick and Kathy Emery and his brother, Doug, and his wife, Jan Emery. And we have enjoyed having Doug and Jan here with us for the last several months. It's been great to have you here. Last week, we were joined by another Emory brother, Tori Emory, and his wife, Susan, got to visit with them last week. And this week, his sister and her husband, John, are here. So we are just excited to have the Emory clan with us today. Could you welcome All right, now what you all came for, barbecue. <laughs> but you can't have that until we pray. So I'm going to pray now. Father God, thank you for joy. Thank you for fellowship. Thank you for the fact that so often in the New Testament, we see fellowship happening over food. And Lord, we, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for the hands that prepared it. And Lord, we thank you for making it possible. We give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. If you will exit out this door, grab a plate, and eat until you're full.